Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to today's edition of EPC Talks Geopolitics. Uh, today, I am totally delighted to be joined by Ukraine's Minister for Energy, uh, Mr. German Galuschenko. For those of you who are not yet familiar with EPC Talks Geopolitics, it is a new signature initiative that aims to bring decision makers, practitioners, academics and thought leaders for a 45 minute interactive online conversation on key issues relevant to Europe and its role in the world. Uh, and frankly, there aren't many things that are more geopolitical than gas, a commodity that has been weaponized many times by Russia. Most recently, Moscow has tried to exploit the energy price spike and the subsequent drop in the volumes of gas uh, to get Nord Stream 2 rapidly commissioned. Unfortunately, a sh rather short-sighted energy policy uh, towards Russia by uh, the EU that still fails to have um, a collective energy policy continues to allow the Kremlin to use gas as a leverage, not as much as in the past, um, but still the leverage is there. Now, Ukraine is an important strategic uh, energy partner for the EU. Uh, and the minister is going to share with us today some ideas as to how uh, Kiev and the EU can strengthen cooperation in the energy field to reduce Moscow's ability to weaponize gas. Now, before I start, um, I would like to remind the audience that they can put their questions either by writing in the Q&A box or by clicking on the hand icon. And I would really encourage you to start to do this at the beginning because we don't have that much time. As I said, we only have 45 minutes and it goes by quite quickly. Uh, so let's crack on with this discussion. Uh, and I would like to start by asking the minister if he can outline uh, the ideas that Kiev have for this new regional energy security partnership. Um, that was more or less conceived in response to the current energy crisis. So the floor is yours, minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for your presentation. Um, of course, uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this uh, online event. It's, I think that it's really a very important topic. And uh, as you absolutely rightly mentioned, that uh, we are really the country which feels uh, all the dangers and all these things uh, connected with the energy security and security of supply. Um, of course, uh, as other countries of, of Europe, Ukraine is alarmed by the ongoing undersupply of gas to the EU. A, and in this regard, of course, we welcome the efforts of the European Commission on developing measures to react on current crisis and, of course, closely coordinate with the EU counterparts on this matter. And we are talking, first of all, about the range of uh, instruments which should be developed to uh, and implemented to protect the European consumers uh, from the high price swings and prevent gas deficit. Um, we see that there is some um, immediate steps which which supposed to be uh, uh, to be taken uh, as as quickly as we can. And of course, we of course need to achieve uh, some results to ensure additional gas flow especially we are talking when we are talking about the bomb garden area and we understand that this uh, cluster of the european gas grid consumers about uh, 90 bcm per year and we see that uh, it will face a severe gas shortage if the gas transit via ukraine would be reduced or terminated that is also a, a chance, one of the ways which we estimated and which we see with very, uh, very possible, possible way of, of uh, uh, situation would go. Uh, secondly, we also have a proposition or some ideas uh, to create some kind of regional gas fund, <clears throat> which um, some kind of uh, strategic uh, gas reserve uh, and it would also uh, could be used Ukraine here as a country which has uh, storages and these storages uh, could be used for this, uh, for this goal of, of uh, the special reserve for the Europe. Um, 
Today, we <clears throat> would like also briefly present our view on current situation with the gas flow to the EU. And you already mentioned uh, this, our one of our initiative, which is the Regional Energy Security Partnership, uh, which we already presented uh, to some of the, uh, to the lot of countries of EU countries, and we also presented to the European Commission. So uh, we would like also to share the, our view on this regional energy security partnership uh, uh, right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, dear friends. Uh, my name is Alena Smolovska. I'm director for a uh, reform support team uh, with the Ministry of Energy. This initiative is sponsored by the uh, uh, European Commission and the BRD, and we uh, uh, support uh, the ministry in uh, uh, coordination with our European partners and with development of uh, uh, reforms. Uh, if I may, I, would, uh, I will present briefly this initiative, and I would like to ask to launch the presentation, if possible. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, here we have on the uh, on the title page we have this uh, basic idea, which which is behind the regional energy security uh, partnership uh, uh, RASP. Is uh, it shows that there is a uh, section of the European gas grid which is fairly isolated from the rest of the European network, and this uh, uh, specific area is very much dependent on uh, uh, physical gas flows to this area through uh, basically two uh, entry routes. It's either the Ukrainian uh, gas transmission system or the Nord Stream uh, connected to, to this place via Opal, Oegel, and the uh, uh, pipelines in Czech Republic. We will briefly uh, we will discuss this uh, this structure in, in more detail in, the, in a couple of minutes, and if I uh, may ask to switch to the next slide, please. So what is the matter of concern here that we see now? We have, uh, 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 we have analyzed how much gas Gazprom is normally sending to the EU in this time of the year. And uh, here you can see on the screen, on the screen, a comparison of uh, uh, actual gas flows to the EU via Nord Stream 1, Ukrainian route, Yamal Europe pipeline, which brings gas to Germany via Poland and Turk Stream. So we can see that gas flows have decreased slightly in 2020, which was the COVID year with, the, with reduced uh, uh, consumption in the, in the EU and with a lot of uh, LNG available uh, to, uh, to compete with the pipeline gas uh, from Russia. What we see is happening now when gas is expensive in the world and LNG is not readily available for this part of the world. We see that Gazprom is reducing gas flows compared to the low demand COVID year, which is a very alarming sign, uh, which may uh, cause potentially a gas deficit, a physical gas deficit in this area in the first quarter of 2022. We see that gas storages in the EU uh, have been filled with delay and the gas storages which are owned by Gazprom are not filled to the normal level still. Uh, and uh, we see that this situation was under supply has uh, worsened in October and November. We see that the uh, currently Gazprom is under supplying uh, almost a third of normal gas flows if we compare with the COVID year 2020. And if we compare it with, with uh, the regular year to uh, 2019, then this undersupply is over 40%. Um, can we move to the next place, slide, please? If we look at the breakdown by routes, we see that Nord Stream 1 is used to the maximum level and no changes happen there. However, the other traditional routes, the Yamal Europe uh, and the Ukrainian route, see the largest cuts. So we see that the uh, uh, entry to Germany via Yamal Europe is very, very far below the normal level of this time of the year. And uh, when we hear uh, statements from the Russian side that, hey, we have increased gas flows to Germany, this is not exactly the case. This data is available on Gazprom's website, on NSOG website, 
and uh, what we have done, we have just put it into the charts to make uh, these figures more visible. Uh, we also hear that some flows have been probably redirected to uh, to the Turk stream. However, if we look at this uh, at this route, we see that it still uh, doesn't play the, a major role in supplying the EU uh, with gas. Uh, and what we see here is that uh, Gazprom is drying up the uh, section of the market which we call the Baumgarten area. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what is the Baumgarten area? It is an isolated and fragmented section of the European uh, gas grid, which includes not only Ukraine or Slovakia or Hungary. It includes uh, a wide range of countries, including south of Germany, north, northeast or east of France, north of Italy, entire markets of Austria, Slovakia, Slovenia, southern part of Poland and some mark, uh, some share in the markets of Hungary, Ukraine, Moldova and Romania. So these countries collectively consume about 90 BCM a year. And uh, uh, what we are seeing is that was the new diversionary pipelines. Gazprom is recreating market fragmentation, which existed before the third energy package was put into place. Uh, Earlier, this fragmentation was achieved by destination clauses, which were deemed to be illegal by the European Commission and, uh, and the EU, and they were removed. However, now Gazprom is uh, using the same tactics, tactics, achieving the same goal with supplying a limited volume of gas to each individual country using the, uh, uh, the new pipeline they have constructed and, uh, um, and, and are now trying to um, certify. If these risks are not addressed, this rerouting of gas will reinforce Gazprom's bargaining power against the countries of, the, of this region, and this will curb competition and create upward pressure on prices. If you move to the next slide, you can see this region on the uh, on the map and you can see the scope of the problem it, it really is not only about the central and eastern europe it also concerns a number of countries in western europe and uh, there, there is a complication to the situation that these countries cannot easily source gas from elsewhere if gazprom decides to cut uh, gas flows here and this is this is why it is so important that gas flows through Ukraine are uh, kept uh, at a reasonably high level so that we do not have to fight between each other in this region to try to source uh, scarce volumes of gas. We see that this uh, reduction of gas flows, which is happening in 2021, may cause gas deficit in the first quarter of 2022. And it is already causing the uh, uh, higher than normal prices in this region. If the gas flows would continue in their normal uh, volume, they, it's, it's easy to, uh, um, to, uh, to expect that the gas prices would be in a far more reasonable level than they are now. So what is the essence of the RESP initiative we are proposing? Please kindly switch to the next slide, please. The RESP initiative, the Regional Energy Security Partnership, um, is where is our proposal to develop and implement very practical measures and solutions which could improve this situation with this over dependence on a single supplier of physical gas. There are three components to, to this uh, initiative. The short term would include securing additional gas flows to the Baumgarten area uh, via Ukraine. To support this, uh, Ukraine has even offered a special uh, discount for additional volumes, which go beyond what is booked by Gazprom. Uh, it, we should also uh, look at ensuring firm interconnection capacities, uh, which are not dependent on uh, uh, the, the transit itself. And we should ensure financial, financial instruments for gas purchases in this region. So this is the short term component. The midterm component um, includes creating a shared strategic gas reserves in uh, underground gas storages in this re region. Uh, and uh, the largest gas storages in this area are in Ukraine, 
However, there might be some additional gas storages in other countries which are connected to this area. Uh, we also should work together to ensure bi-directional bi firm capacities to, uh, to guarantee that all consumers in this area have access to gas. And uh, this uh, strategic gas reserve should be structured in a transparent way, have, have a secure uh, and uh, reliable governance and uh, provide access to gas on certain conditions, which are clear and uh, accessible to everybody. In the long term, to solve, to address this current situation with over-dependence on Gazprom in this area, we believe it's important to develop commercially attractive ways to bring alternative gas here, and the alternative gas in this area would probably be LNG. There are several ways uh, points from where this Baumgarten area could source LNG, and they range from Poland to uh, uh, Croatia, Greece, Turkey. There are pipelines in place which could deliver this gas to the area, and this it can be stored in Ukrainian gas storages, for instance. However, we need to work uh, together with the uh, Commission and with the member states to ensure that there are bundled capacities, very easily accessible tariff uh, products to bring this gas into the Baumgarten area. For that, we proposed to uh, uh, have a task force which would assess technical and legal limitations and develop such bundled capacities, such new products. So this, in essence, is our proposal to the current uh, gas crisis. And uh, we look forward to discussing it with, uh, uh, with you, Amanda, and with the uh, uh, people who are participating in this event. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this overview um, of, the, of the RESP, the RESP initiative. Um, maybe you, we could start by um, understanding what sort of interest has been shown already um, by EU member states and in others in being involved um, in this. Um, thank you, uh, Amanda. We really negotiate a lot of a lot of. Uh... Uh, uh, already a lot of uh, countries and also with the EU, we, uh, we have negotiated with trader association, market uh, members, uh, with the German government, energy community. And in fact, what we see that uh, the, there is a general support of initiative realization. Uh, now, what, what, what is very important, we need to understand how or how legally or what legal entity should be configured to be, to be able to effectively manage it, the fund and uh, provide the services. So that is now a question of uh, more the structure, how, how it should be structured. Thank you. Uh, maybe a follow-up question. I mean, Ukraine's proposal was put on the table after the European Commission came with a toolbox of measures um, for tackling rising energy prices. How does your initiative correlate with the measures proposed by the Commission? Um, could the EU toolbox be applicable to Ukraine? Um, uh, in fact, the toolbox uh, uh, doesn't uh, propose short-term measures. And uh, of course, in the long-term run, uh, it proposed storage reserves. Uh, uh, and of course, very important that our initiatives go in line with the with the EU one. Uh, in this regard, our initiative, which is uh, we call it like RESP, and what we, was presented right now, is that uh, it's not only about Ukraine. Uh, th that is what is important. We are not talking only about our country. So we are talking that that is the issue and the problem for the whole region. Okay, um, thank you very much. I mean, it's clear that this is a this is an issue for for the whole region. Um, you're right on that. But let's just let's stick on, stick on the issue um, of this idea to create a shared gas um, facility, which is which has been compared to something similar to the IMF. Who do you view as being uh, the main stakeholders in this gas fund, um, and what could be the the conditions? 
I mean, have you already discussed this with partners to find out if there's a, if there's a huge interest or a huge buy-in and how long would it actually take um, to set something like this up? Because I mean, I can't, I can't imagine it's just going to take a couple of weeks. Huh? I mean, sometimes this can take rather a long time. Uh, thank you. Uh, of course, I mean, we we would be happy to to settle uh, all these issues uh, like in, in weeks or even in days. But what we see that is really, of course, now it's on the level of political uh, discussion. And uh, afterwards, we can move to the to the technical negotiation, uh, and that's what depends on EU decision. Uh, we already already offered our 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 in infrastructure capacities and um, so now we uh, want to understand how it's legally could be done uh, and um, of course uh, we have also to understand the the technical questions like conditions uh, volumes uh, and uh, in that case if if uh, you have or or participate people who participate today have any any ideas we would be glad if uh, you would share with us if i if i may add here uh, of course this is just a uh, pr the the first stage of discussion of this initiative and we have provided it as a response to uh, what we see is happening now in Brussels, the discussions between member states. This initiative was discussed in the ministerial uh, meeting of energy ministers of the EU. Like we see that people are looking for solutions and uh, various countries and, uh, and the governments are trying to find a coordinated way to deal with this crisis. Because the, uh, uh, the worst which can happen is that every single country would be facing uh, uh, the powerful supplier by itself. Um, if we look at the, the volumes uh, consumed by these countries, we see that this is a quarter of the EU consumption and uh, almost a half of Gazprom's exports to the EU. If uh, we deal united in this matter, then we will be able to, uh, to have a, uh, an equal bargaining power and uh, make sure that the conditions are attractive to uh, all of the consumers in this area. However, if no solution is found, uh, then uh, we will see cases when Gazprom will negotiate long-term contracts with uh, each country uh, one by one. And uh, what we already have heard from the Russian side, that the current crisis is caused not by the withholding of gas flows to the EU, but by the unreasonably rushed decarbonization uh, plans and the, uh, the move uh, of the EU to achieve climate goals, which are probably too fast. We are concerned that, that by causing this crisis, uh, Gazprom may intervene with the decarbonization agenda and achieving climate goals in the EU. So we are sure that uh, uh, tackling this situation is uh, also necessary to continue the move of, uh, of our continent to the uh, uh, cleaner fuels and uh, decarbonization. So that's why this is our response to, to this situation. We do not want to have uh, uh, the gas market uh, destroyed uh, and everybody backed to the long-term contracts, which would be negotiated under the worst time, the highest prices and the probably the, the least advantageous conditions to the consumers. Just sticking um, to the issue of Russia for a moment, because in your, in your concept, um, you also propose to set up this trilateral format with Russia um, to negotiate, you know, particularly new longer term uh, contracts. Um, and I understand this trilateral format assumes engagement of the European Commission that it, that would be expected by your side would appoint um, some sort of special envoy with a corresponding mandate. If the Commission takes it positively, do you have an idea who it could be from the Commission side? Um, and have you already negotiated prolongation of contract with Russia? And what could you put on the table to get Russia interested um, in these suggestions? Because it's, it's not always easy to get the Kremlin interested in these things, right? Uh, you're absolutely right, yeah. That is uh, our point that, of course, why, why we are talking about trilateral format. 
of negotiations because uh, we already uh, we already have uh, a chance to see the effectiveness of of such format which which was in 2014 then in 2019 and uh, the uh, participation of european european commission really helped to to settle this issue with with uh, gas contract with russian and of course we know that there are people in uh, european commission who already who was involved in in this settlement of this issue and they really aware of all let's say i don't know how to say it's peculiarities let's say of of the russian behavior and uh, that is really very important and of course we understand that when uh, since the gas is not a commodity for Russians, and, uh, and we understand that in that case, it's it's very important to create conditions uh, uh, when they have no other options just to use it or to speak about the gas as commodity. And of course, uh, we understand that it's very dangerous to start any kind of, of uh, negotiations with the Gazprom like separately, like one by one and especially in 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 uh, in in our and in our situation and we understand that we need to uh, to make some kind of pressure uh to to follow the market conditions that is really very important and uh we we understand that the market conditions should be strictly followed in in the negotiations with with uh, supplying of gas from Gazprom um, thank you, um, Minister. Um, I'd like now to touch back onto this issue of the green energy uh, transition because we've obviously been hearing, you know, a lot about that at the recent um, COP26 um, in in Glasgow. I mean, this is ongoing discussion over how long natural gas is going to be a transitional fuel. I think probably it's going to be a transitional fuel longer than um, some people had perhaps hoped or expected. So, in this context, how do you manage to tackle? Um, this particular issue against the background that Ukraine fully shares the objectives of the Green Deal um, and, has, and has even launched and focused a dialogue on, on the Green Deal issue. I mean, I know that Ukraine has actually made some important steps in, in, this, uh, in this domain, so it'd be interesting to hear about this. Uh, uh, thank you. In fact, yeah, I was personally also in Glasgow and I see all this initiative and, uh, and it really it was a great and great uh, possibilities to declare the positions of the country and uh, of course we support the green deal goals and uh, we ukraine we have even more ambitions plans and we already declared this plan that to re uh, to reduce our emissions by 20 65% till 2030 from the volumes of 19 uh, and uh, of course we we can do this because we see that our energy mix uh, right now is very good and uh, we already produce our energy sector produce uh, 30 percent less carbon emission than some of the eu countries we have uh, for instance 200 grams of co u per one kilowatt hour and uh, in europe it's it's something around around 300 so in that case, we see that we really have very good potential. And one of the goals, which we also say that we want to decarbonize our, our special energy sector and to decarbonize our economy. Uh, and now we are working on detailed plans on, on the decarbonization. Uh, and we really expected that we would achieve these goals, what, what we already scheduled for for uh, 2030 but we also see that we have very good potential to do it even even to achieve these goals even even earlier thank you minister and i'd like to take a couple of the questions that we have coming in from from the floor um from adrian uh, kondazowski and i hope i did not hash the pronunciation of of that name um, he's from the Polish uh, permanent representation, and he's saying that he heard uh, you, as in Kiev, had preliminary discussions on this idea in Brussels, so wanted to ask what was the DG energy take um, on this. I think he's talking about um, how this could fit into the SOS gas groups. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much for this uh, for this question. Indeed, we are discussing uh, this initiative uh, also in the framework of the uh, uh, regulation uh, on security of supply. Um, Ukraine is one uh, is a part of one of the gas groups, uh, and we also explore uh, this mechanism of uh, solidarity as one of the legal ways, but possible legal ways on how to make this initiative happen. Because the the gas group, uh, the risk group where Ukraine is a member under this regulation, is in, includes basically most of the countries uh, of the Baumgarten area, and this could be a starting point for uh, for legal uh, structuring. Uh, there exist also other ways to uh, to um, approach this uh, this idea. We are also in discussions with the DGNR and uh, other uh, counterparts in the European Commission on this. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have a question from uh, Dimitro uh, Shudko. Um, and his first question is, how realistic is the idea to use Ukrainian storage for keeping EU strategic gas reserves? Uh so we have understanding that it's absolutely real and we have very good storages which is really the biggest one of the biggest in europe uh it's could store up to 32 bcm and uh we in fact could could uh, uh could be the really the let's say the the main we call it like hub or whatever we could call it for for store gas gas in europe and that is absolutely realistic we okay. also have, I'm sorry, sorry, we also have a, a precedent when uh, 10 BCM of gas were stored in Ukrainian storages last winter. Um, we uh, we have demonstrated the the power of the of these facilities, and uh, the traders have enjoyed the interconnectivity of uh, our uh, gas grid with the rest of the European uh, uh, countries in this area. So it's uh, in in this Baumgarten area, Ukrainian storages are the largest ones. We have spare capacity which we could uh, offer uh to the uh, european uh, side to uh, to create this gas reserve and to manage it wisely um thank you i, I also have a second question here from um dimitro um he's saying there's a lot of speculations in particular from gasprom that nord stream is designed also for the transportation of hydrogen um in the future how real um is this perspective from your point of view um, and also, have you considered how Ukrainian gas transportation system um, to be used for hydrogen transmission after the era of hydrocarbons is over? Uh, frankly, uh, uh, that the first time I, I've heard that Nord Stream 2 is for hydrogen. In that case, I, I would uh, propose to certify it immediately. Uh, uh, and what about the the uh, Ukraine? Of course, we we think about hydrogen. That is one of the uh, one one of the um, important issues. And for, for us, we understand that this is very important uh, trend for hydrogen. And we now discuss what hydrogen could be because we already produce hydrogen. We have nuclear. Uh, nuclear energy, uh, nuclear sector, and which is already produced use hydrogen for its own use uh, but now we uh, also in the discussion how uh, this hydrogen whether it could be uh, good for uh, for possible export and uh, we're also uh, thinking on uh, the possibilities to use pipes for hydrogen but what we see at this at this stage that uh, we don't have like uh, the concrete answer right now that these pipes could be used for for hydrogen uh, uh, for hydrogen export, for instance, to Europe. Uh, we understand that probably uh, there, there should be done some kind of modification and we don't have some concrete figures on how, how costly it is and whether it's possible to do quickly or maybe it's, it's better, let's say, to build some new, new pipes, especially for hydrogen. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Um, now to switch a bit from the topic of um, gas to uh, electricity, um, because at the last um, summit in Kiev, the leaders agreed to establish a high-level working group to accelerate electricity 
and gas market reforms in Ukraine and to coordinate further steps for the integration of gas and electricity mar markets. So maybe you can tell us what are the main tasks and challenges uh, for Ukraine in the, in the context of energy reforms and how do you see the prospect of Ukraine's full integration into the EU energy market? Um, thank you very much. So we, yeah, that's that's the truth that we raised this issue for joint group for for integration of the market, and we discussed this with uh, Kadri Simpson, and uh, we would discuss it again. Uh, and we really want to to push uh, the the work of of this of this group. What is very important that that is our strategic goal. Uh, to integrate our energy system, and this is a question of synchronization with uh, EU. Uh, and we, we, we already already uh, said that this is very important issue for Ukraine, and we see this as two two aspects of such such uh, movement. First of all, that is a technical synchronization, and we already have some draft report from INSUE, which shows that uh, Ukrainian energy system is stable and very good for, for the technical synchronization. And we understand that another, another uh, way, uh, it, and, and another topic, which is also very important, that is the, the synchronization of the markets. And we already have a new a new, uh, a new market, and uh, we have a new laws. It has already exists uh, two years. So we, uh, we, uh, we, we understand that we need to make probably some some additional steps to synchronize our legislation, to synchronize our market rules with with EU one, and that is very important in the process of of synchronization, which is a strategic goal for our country. But in, I mean, in the context of, you know, electricity reform, I mean, what are the main challenges uh, ahead, in, ahead in this field? Because there's a lot of focus, you know, um, on, on, the, on the other fossil fuels, but in terms of, of electricity, I mean, what are the key challenges for Ukraine? Uh, in fact, that, that, that is really the, the, the main challenge is what we see for, for uh, for for us in the electricity sector is synchronization, and in this regard, we uh, we want to uh, to to make our market rules uh, to be absolutely the same as in Europe, because otherwise it could be also one kind of problem for us to to fully synchronize with with Europe. And we we, we schedule this for uh, next year the the first two let's say two step of uh, isolated mode. And then uh, we scheduled 2023 uh, as a term of, of uh, uh, final synchronization of Ukrainian energy system with the EU. Um, I would also, I'm sorry, I would also like to add that the uh, synchronization with NSOE is the uh, key to all further uh, reforms in Ukraine's uh, electricity market, because it will help us to uh, start phasing out uh, coal generation, coal power generation, and to uh, move to achieving the decarbonization goals of Ukraine. Uh, it will also launch the uh, uh, development of new uh, new business opportunities in Ukraine for businesses from both inside the country and outside investors. And it's, it is also important in terms of security of supply of our country. If we are connected to a larger European market, we can both help our neighbors with uh, uh, balancing their energy system and uh, also rely on the larger markets when uh, we use our uh, huge generation capacities here in Ukraine. It's, it's not really widely known, but Ukrainian transmission system has been designed initially to export large vol volumes of uh, energy to, uh, to the Europe, to the EU. And uh, we uh, we also have uh, we would also like to to use this uh, infrastructure which we have uh, to support our neighbors which have deficit in uh, in energy to more effectively balance their systems and to help them with the uh, decarbonization agenda. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question because uh, we're nearly out of time. Um, Ukraine um, has proposed additional flows. Um, of gas via Ukraine at a discounted tariff. Um, how is Kiev going to deal with providing these additional flows and what sort of discount um, are you talking about? Um, 
Uh, th th that's right. So we really uh, made such proposition. The idea of us was that uh, that is additional flows uh, not connected to the contract which we have now, the transit contract with Russian. So, and we could uh, provide up to 55 BCM per year and additional flows to Europe. And that is also the question of, of security of supply and the crisis which is now in Europe. And in order to uh, to make this, we ready to, to give a discount for our uh, system tariffs. Uh, and uh, in fact, we are not now talking about the figures because we want to, to see the the interest in this uh, in this proposal. And if if uh, we understand, we we sure that that is possible, we sure that this is one of the effective way of solutions of this energy crisis and lack of gas in the storages in Europe. And uh, we are ready to discuss discounts, I mean, uh, on the table when, when uh, all parties would be ready to discuss. This is not now about the figures. This is the question we show that in, in this crisis, uh, we, uh, we are not talking about the level of discounts. We are talking about that we are ready to supply gas to Europe. And we, we are not talking about the money. We are talking about the security of supply. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, and as a final question um, from Ionella uh, Kiolan, who is asking, as Ukraine is negotiating a trade deal with China, are there any projects to increase the Ukrainian energy resilience with the help of Chinese partners? Not at this stage. I don't aware of any, any such kind of negotiations. OK, um, with that, I need to draw this uh, meeting to a close because we try to keep to the 45 minute time frame. I would like to thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister, for joining us today, um, for sharing Ukraine's new initiative uh, with us, with the audience. I think it's something that's incredibly important uh, and interesting, and I hope that it will definitely be pursued and taken forward by your partners uh, in Europe. So I wish you the very best of luck with that. Um, and to the audience, thank you for joining us today, being part of this conversation. And I wish everybody uh, an excellent afternoon. Thank you again, Minister. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.